Welcome everyone. It's an honor to speak on this conference. When a flower rises towards the morning light, is it thinking of sorrow? When a plowman comes out for his labor, is he thinking of fatigue? When the singing birds become fledged, are they thinking of winter colds? So should the disciples welcome joyfully the approaching hour and our destination will manifest over the flame of mystery. Not in vain were you summoned. From the eternal depths, I drew your souls out. Our disciples come with us for an entrance to our abode is more beautiful than the biggest pearl of the world. The sailing ones we welcome. I am with you. These were the guiding words of Master Moria that accompanied Rurik family aboard the steamer Macedonia, heading from Marcel to Bombay, India. Their new stage of life was about to unfold. Russia, Europe, America remained behind. Each of them spent years in preparation for this long cherished journey. They all carried their own skills and knowledge. However, all the four were united by inspiration, enthusiasm, and common task. It was December, 1923. The way of the Rariks led to the Eastern Himalayas, to Darjeeling. Here, they began their preparation for the Central Asiatic Expedition. After exploring the neighboring kingdom of Sikkim, in 1925, they left for Kashmir and further continued their journey to Ladakh and the desert lands of Chinese Turkestan. From there, they entered to Soviet Russia and after an important visit to Moscow, they departed to the mountainous Altai. Further followed Mongolia and cruel detention in Tibet. After crossing the Trans Himalayas, the expedition proceeded along the biggest river of Tibet, Brahmaputra, and finally, quote, after such an ordeal befallen on us, with a great relief, we again beheld the mighty Kanchenjunga, under which snowy mass the Rurik's expedition started its route in 1925, and in 1928 successfully completed its journey around the Central Asia, end quote, wrote George Rurik in his monograph, Trails to Inmost Asia, which described in detail the most valuable geographical, archaeological, ethnographical, and linguistic observations carried out by the expedition in almost unexplored regions of Asia. This publication placed the young Orientalist to one line with such famous researchers of Asia as Przewalski, Potanin, Kozlov, and Hedin. The next stage became an establishment of a special institute for research of the countless material collected by the expedition and development of the spheres of science formed during this unprecedented journey. Thus, the Urusvati Himalayan Research Institute was founded on 24 July, 1928. Helena Rarik became the honorary president and founder, Nicholas Rarik, its president and founder, and George, its director. Following the advice of the teacher, the Rurik family shifts to the Western Himalayas. An ancient valley of Kulu, the valley of 360 gods, was chosen as the best location for the activity of the Research Institute. In January 1929, the Rurik's moved into the whole estate in the village of Nagar, situated at the altitude of 1760 meters. In this valley, unique in all respects, the whole family worked tirelessly for almost 20 years until the demise of Nicholas Rarik. In her letter, Helena Rarik thus wrote about the plans of the research center. The center should be developed into a city of knowledge. In this city, we wish to create a synthesis of scientific achievements. Therefore, all branches of science should eventually be established there. And since the source of knowledge lies in the cosmos, the co-workers of the scientific center should belong to the whole world. That is, should include all nationalities. And as the cosmos is indivisible in all its functions, the scientists of the world should be indivisible in their achievements. In other words, they should be united in closest cooperation. 
we may speak hours and hours about the work undertaken and accomplished by this institute. But right now, I want to reflect upon the Rick's works from the energy point of view. We know that the valley being situated very far from the civilized world itself contained energy accumulated over the centuries. The Rurik family formed a powerful energy nucleus driven by the awareness of their spiritual mission. Plus the proximity of high mountains of the Himalayan range, providing different possibilities for the subtle bodies. Quote, you know that at an altitude of 11,000 feet, the astral body acquires a special quality, end quote. Altogether, it was a mighty spiritual amalgam combined for achieving the highest possible breakthrough on the path of spiritual growth. After the demise of Nicholas Rurik in December 1947, Helena Rurik and George soon after left the estate. They hardly knew they would never come back. Their departure was very hurried apparently because of political unrest in the valley during the year of the independence struggle in India and division of the country along the religious lines. All achievements, everything accomplished by the Rurik's within 19 years of their life in Nagar created a powerful energy on all levels. It became a potent spiritual magnet lay there in anticipation of further manifestations. The Rurik Hall estate became the property of Svetoslav and Devi Karani Rurik, who used to visit it occasionally, but otherwise no activity was going on there and it slowly started to deteriorate. Unfortunately, during those unattended years, a huge amount of valuable things and Rurik belongings was stolen from the house and the research institute buildings. In 1991, Svetoslav and Devi Karani requested their friend, a German lady settled in India, Sister Ursula Eichstadt, to become the manager of the estate. In 1992, Svetoslav and Devika, helped by the then ambassador of Russia in India, Mr. Alexander Kadakin, officially founded the International Rurik Memorial Trust. Quote, a welfare and charitable trust for the purposes of collecting, preserving, extending, and administering for the benefit of humanity, the scientific, educational, research, cultural, and artistic works and activities achieved, established, and maintained by the members of the Rurik family, and also the various paintings, books, and works of arts and scientific research established, owned, or maintained by them in several parts of India and several countries in the world, world in accordance with the objects enumerated in these presents." End quote from the deed of trust. As we can see, the stated tasks were very ambitious. Sister Ursula worked in the trust for 11 years, but because of many initial difficulties, the activities were minimal. Back in 1989, during the last visit of Svetoslav and Devi Karani in Moscow, I was introduced to Svetoslav Rerik and requested his permission to visit them in Bangalore. Svetoslav Rerik nodded affirmatively. From 1990, as an Indology research scholar in the Institute of Culture of the Ramakrishna Mission, I lived in Kolkata, West Bengal state of India. However, it was only in April 1991 that I was finally able to accomplish my long awaited trip to Bangalore. For two weeks, I used to daily visit Svetoslav and Devi Karani in their room at the Ashoka Hotel. I used to ask Svetoslav Redik hundreds of different questions, but invariably, he would always change the topic, coming to only one subject, Nagar Estate. I used to be quite puzzled because I was dying to hear anything and everything about Helena Redik, not about the place I've never been. But apparently, he had different plans. Every time he used to narrate about Nagar estate, about its importance to carry the work further, and so on. I could not grasp the meaning of the things then, but I noted down scrupulously everything he and Devika were telling. Interestingly, at the same time, briefly arrived, arrived Sister Ursula, who was already been appointed as a manager 
of the estate. Svetoslav Radik introduced us and requested sister Ursula to provide me with everything when I come to Nagar. All in all, I had wonderful time of unforgettable communication with Svetoslav and Devika. On the last day of my visit, Svetoslav Radik blessed me in a Russian style and told, I want you to work for our Nagar estate. Rather taken aback and maybe not very politely, I answered that I have different plans now. He just smiled enigmatically. When I was departing, we agreed to meet soon again, but alas, it never happened. Because of my PhD studies, I went back to Moscow and then in January 1993, we received the news about his demise. I returned to India soon after, bringing and installing a memorial plate on the stupa of Helena Radic in Kalimpong. That was the task Svetoslav Radic entrusted to me at the time of our meetings. The life went on, and exactly 10 years after his prediction, in 2001, I found myself arriving to Nagar Radic Estate as its curator and executive director. Amazingly, reading my meeting records with Svetoslav Radic many years after, I realized that everything he told me as necessary to be done in Nagar was a complete work program mission for me. I can say now that his plan was later accomplished almost entirely. But before that, I arrived to Nagar first time in 1994 and totally fell in love with the cool valley. From that time onwards, I used to come often from Kolkata to Nagar, helping Ursula with many things in the estate, doing my own research and so on. The real work though started with my official appointment as the representative of Russia from 2002. I completely, totally gave myself to this work or rather the mission as I deem it to be. Step by step with enthusiasm in one breath in utmost psychic tension, initially with our own hands and later with the invaluable help of many Rorik societies from different places and countries, we turned the ruins into thriving international cultural hub with buzzing activities on all possible levels. Now looking back, I realized that what was accomplished couldn't be done without the help from the higher forces or rather to say that enormous amount of energy accumulated by the Rorik's at their time. 11 years of my work there flew by, by like one wave, but it was undoubtedly the ninth wave. This is the art gallery in the estate. There are uh, photos from some of the projects we did in the Nagar estate, medicinal plants. We found on the outskirts of Nagar, we found uh, 52 ancient stone slabs and we were allowed to bring them, to clean them and we built approximately the same place as, as they were before. We built a beautiful open air theater on the place, which was just like a place where people were throwing the garbage. We built a beautiful theater. It is said, betrayal like a shadow follows the achievement. Equal was our situation in, in Nagar. At the height of our creative growth and all round achievements and ambitious plans, we were betrayed by our own Rorik people, aided by the local government, which was consistently trying to capture the trust even before. There is no time now to describe desperate fight for the trust. It made the headlines in all Indian newspapers for quite a period. The trust was treacherously captured on a gross physical level. But the new owners miscalculated. Spiritual energy does not serve the invaders. Now, 10 years after, the trust stands quiet and abandoned. Nevertheless, our work, dedicated and selfless, was the beginning of Helena Rorik's dream of Nagar becoming a center of, of culture and knowledge. At least for a decade, but we were bringing to life the ideas of the banner of peace, the trinity of the foundations of cultural life. Quote, 
look for the young ones, teach the young ones. And we carry culture, art, and knowledge to the people. And first of all, to the young generation of the Venn. These are some photos from Helena Rarik Art College, which we established in our trust and which had around 200 children from the locality and seven different art departments. What I wanted to say is that two harmonious psychic energy magnets, the past and the present merged and created a united common wave. I, I believe it remains there on the subtle level for the future. Now from the past through the present, how to move to the challenging future? Thinking about the topic stated at this conference led me to following questions. How to help regenerate the thought in the world? How to explain a new rhythm? how to raise the consciousness level, how to put the higher thinking into daily life practice. And this evolved the main question, how and what can we, the followers of Agni Yoga teaching, do on our part as a joint contribution to current world awakening process? We all have one common spiritual origin, the teachers and the teaching given by them. Agni Yoga extensively talks and explains in details the very process of transition to the new era. It gives necessary knowledge and understanding of the energies involved. It provides spiritual guidance. It broadens one's consciousness and enlightens one's heart. It describes multiple spiritual qualities required for developing a higher state of consciousness. Then each of us has our own individual practice based upon this origin. So the follower of the teaching should acquire a clear understanding of the laws governing current time, a deep awareness of continuous necessary self-growth and spiritual transmutation, as well as implement this knowledge in daily life, showing an example of a person pertaining to the new world, thus helping other people. That should be happening continuously at one's personal level. But as the members of different Agni Yoga world groups together, can we perhaps do something more for helping to draw near the new world? First of all, I think we need to cooperate more closely. We are still divided. It is high time to overcome whatever differences we may have as the representatives of different countries, cultures, and nations. Quote from Om 452. It is necessary to help everywhere and in everything. If obstacles to assistance be encountered through political, national, or social lines, or in religious belief, such obstacles are unworthy of humanity. All covenants point to the necessity of unconditional assistance. Such help may be considered true inspiration. It has been emphasized already, but numerous conventionalities compel one to again affirm the freedom of assistance, end quote. If we stand united by the teaching, we can do it. But if we are not able to accomplish the unity between us as the brothers and sisters in spirit, how we can expect it from those who are far from having esoteric knowledge? How can we then expect the peace on earth? Which implies we are the first to start transforming ourselves in true spirit of the teaching and through our results, others may follow. Quote, part 165. To understand the common aspiration means to construct the temple of the new world, to strive and aspire, thereby nurturing each other will in itself constitute an understanding of the new world an understanding of the teaching, sorry. What to do practically? Well, we cannot expect that all people in the world tomorrow will start reading Agni Yoga. Unfortunately, it isn't possible at this point, but 
Summing up the work done by many Rurik societies, and of course my own work in the Rurik movement for the last 34 years, I would like to highlight those areas of activity that have been infallibly successful with different countries, nations, or cultures. In addition, these points include the areas of activities which may help us all to come closer in joint cooperation. First, developing common Agni Yoga World e-platform to provide maximum place for interaction and cooperation of the Rorik followers, sharing experience, work, difficulties, and challenges. The same platform may become the magnet for attracting young people, explaining them the intricacies of the teaching, answering questions, and helping them to grow spiritually. This work is currently going on in its primary technical stage. Two, Agni Two, Agni Yoga teaching in different world languages. At this moment, the teaching is translated in many world languages. Again, all of them may be brought together at the World Agni Yoga website and be available to any reader around the world. At the same time, we may encourage to bring forth the teaching in other world languages. Also, what is very important, there may be a joint platform for the translators. We know how difficult and complex for understanding can be the paragraphs of Agni Yoga and how more challenging it is to produce a quality translation without distorting its meaning. Such joint platform will help the translators discussing any issues of such work and if necessary, seek counsels from the Agni Yoga experts. Three, Helena Rorick notebooks. The work on their translation started three years ago. Currently, 26 notebooks are available for English speaking people. While Agni Yoga represents the philosophical teaching in its integrity and self sufficiency, these texts provide the wholeness of an uninterrupted process of spiritual path of the Rorik family. We can say, we can say in lines of our conference, the art of higher thinking must be practiced. This is a unique experiment in the history for no initiate before penned down so scrupulously, honestly, and daily for decades, his or her spiritual communication with the teacher, including all the problems and challenges on the path. I would suggest the Rorik societies to work with these notebooks in order to catch the threat of Rorik's life and growth unfolding amidst the most difficult conditions we may only imagine. How this could help? We would, as it were, try on their destiny, step into their stream of life and understand the price they had to pay for being the chosen ones. I notice that often people tend to imagine that the initiates being protected by their masters have a great life devoid of daily problems, emotions, doubts, challenges, while the truth is just the opposite. An endless row of trials of all possible kinds, testing devotion, faith, selflessness, and ability to act without any human reward in view, rather having to cope with misunderstanding, mistrust, slander, and betrayal. And still, moving on, I believe it is extremely important to understand it. Also, some people think that just because they are reading Agni Yoga, they should automatically be protected and shielded by the higher forces from any misfortune. And when that's not happening, they hurry to proclaim that the teaching is fraud. While attentive, contemplative reading into the lines of the notebooks may give a different perspective on the experience of spiritual growth in its entirety. I admit that some may be filled with even more doubts than they had before and retreat. But as we know, only the brave will master the path. As for myself, when in my early 20s, I read Agni Yoga for the first time, I was accompanied by continuous, unexplainable, sometimes even tormenting inner feeling of something left unsaid, something left behind the scene. And only after reading the notebooks, the puzzle got together. It was an intuitive perception of the wholeness of spiritual experience. Agni Yoga is like the main design on the colorful, colorful canvas of the Rorik's life. In my opinion, it is easier to understand the design while contemplating the whole canvas. 
Also, by studying these notebooks, we may start perceiving the teaching itself more personally and thus practice it more perfectly. It is like acquiring a deeper internal tuning. In other words, there is a qualitative difference in the process, like between the change and transmutation. Let us recollect a famous book the teacher used to suggest to his disciples, The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. Nicholas Rick wrote, precisely the imitation, not just following, that's the point. I would say even up to impersonation. Of course, only if we really are serious and established on the path of the teaching. Four, publications. These are some of the works we did uh, in Nagar during 11 years of my work there. It is very important to do uh, the publishing work. And besides the books, small brochures can be prepared on particular topics of Agni Yoga. In fact, Helena Reddick herself was recommending this to her disciples as a very useful practical word with the teaching. And spreading these brochures widely to multiple institutions or libraries. For example, uh, Moldavian Rarik Society are printing such brochures and sending them even to correctional colonies and prisons of the country. And after initial skepticism of the heads of such colonies, the Rorik Society received overwhelming response with requests to send more such brochures. When people start thinking in a new way, the health of every nation will be reignited. This would be the idea behind spreading such popular brochures. And we can all share such work to make the brochures on different subjects in all possible languages. This point leads to another similar one, the journalism and blogs. Agni Yoga followers can be requested to write short essays on various topics of Agni Yoga in simple language with simultaneous use of quotes from the teaching. This would be also an educative aspect of Agni Yoga being spread amidst the broad audience. Five, Agni Yoga in video and audio version. Nowadays, there are plenty audio books available. Agni Yoga books are also available in audio version, at least in Russian language. They may be recorded in other languages too. But there can be another version done that addresses and unites all aspects of perception, bringing forth holistic comprehension and experience. In this way, in Russia, there were recorded several Agni Yoga books with female and male voice alternatively reading the paragraphs while Rurik paintings, carefully chosen to match the subject, are screened with a beautiful accompanying music. For those who just approach, it is a very heartfelt, uplifting experience. Six, art. Teaching the youngsters through the paintings of Nicholas and Svetoslav Radics. Mobile exhibitions of good quality prints of the paintings, plus screening the documentary films available and explaining the paintings and their messages in the teachings line, thus giving an opportunity to attract people to Agni Yoga through the bridge of beauty. Inviting the children to ponder on the paintings and their message, write essays on the subject and so on. There can be also organizing the painting competitions between the schools and countries on Agni Yoga topics, thus bringing children closer on the spiritual platform. Especially now with all electronic possibilities, it is much easier. We used to carry the real paintings from Russia to India and vice versa, which may also be possible sometimes. Also, from time to time, it is possible to organize the art exhibitions of the original Nicholas Reddick paintings in the leading galleries. Our Nagar Trust helped to organize uh, such exhibitions in Indian National Museum in 2002 and again in 2010 at the National Gallery of Modern Arts. Both exhibitions had a great success. There can also be slide programs of uh, Rarix paintings with beautifully selected music shown on digital screens. In Nagar, we had such program continuously screened in the art gallery. It used to collect many people who love to sit and watch the presentation in silence. 
Such screens can be placed in many different institutions, schools, colleges, medical establishment, hospitals, bus, railway stations, or airports. And as Nicolas Zorek used to write, paintings should even be in prisons. Perhaps we all know that Rorik paintings have healing effects. Watching them definitely has soothing and uplifting effect. Then we should put them to work. Seven, celebrations. In India, in the Nagar Trust, every year we organized three days long celebrations of Nicholas Redding birthday from 8th to 10th October. First day always belonged to children. Different schools sent their students to take part in whole day painting competition and simultaneous master classes given by professional painters of different nationalities. The topics were always chosen very thoughtfully and though being very challenging, the kids always mastered them perfectly. At the end of the day, the painters chose the winners in different age categories and distributed the gifts. But most important was the joy of participation and communication between the kids and the painters. 9th October was the main celebration day, starting from the morning puja, which is a religious service in Hindu tradition, prayer for well-being of the people and the world, then opening of an exhibition of some foreign painter and followed by the concert until the very evening. Every year we used to invite wonderful dancing ensembles from different countries and classical Indian music singers and dancers. The students of our Helena Rerich Art College were annually preparing their own cultural program for this occasion. Also, there was always a release of some book by the Rerichs or about them. High-level dignitaries, politicians, and ambassadors of different countries were coming as the guests. And of course, representatives from World Rerich Societies were inevitably present on our celebrations. 10th October traditionally belonged to the International Conference on different relevant topics in lines of the teaching and Agni Yoga activities. But of course, throughout the year, we also celebrated other important dates like Helena Rerich's, George Rerich's, Devi Karani's birthday, and so on. Main celebrations were usually filmed and short documentaries done later. Such celebrations cannot be underestimated for their, they create a powerful psychic energy of kindred souls. We know about the increased powers of aligned consciousnesses. Such harmonious energy produced by the people remains in their souls and saturates the subtle space of the place with higher vibrations. Eight, lecturing. Lecturing on various topics of Agni Yoga at all possible places. I would also like to mention an amazing project undertaken by Moldavian Rurik Society who helped the local hospice the members visit terminally ill people and help them spiritually. They discuss with them, answer their questions, explaining difficult topics such as karma, consciousness, life after death, and so on in lines of the teaching. I think such activities are very challenging and educative for both parties. Nine, conferences, local and international, both in person, and through digital platforms available. Such events should unite Agni Yoga followers all over the world through sharing and pondering on relevant questions or problems faced by humanity. In Nagar, these are photos from Nagar, we used to share the topics in non-official friendly manner, discussing and pondering in order to come to some conclusion for further action. 10. International alignment on 24th day of each month. This has been initiated worldwide two years ago as one of the joint activities of all Rarik followers, marking the new century of Agni Yoga in the world. This undertaking can also be strengthened by bringing more members to join as part of inner discipline and common selfless work for humanity and earth. It is like practice to grow together, helping each other. Quote from Hierarchy 434, help each other, hearken, 
help in the small and in the great. Great help is a wrap upon the future. You know not which is the drop that filled the cup to the brim. Help wherever the hand can reach, wherever a thought can fly. Thus shall we wrap upon the future. Hence, let us remember that each hour taken from oneself will be recorded for the future. The heart aflame with help is our heart. Thus we may face the time which is terrible for the ignorant, but bright for the knowing." End quote. 11. Astrology. Agnioga books are full of frequent mentions about the planetary bodies and their powerful impact on Earthlings. To his disciples, M.M. stressed many times importance to learn astrology. We know that Svetoslav Rerik used to counsel Catherine Campbell on astrological issues from his quite young age. In Nagararik estate, he made multiple astrological heroes' diaries with many handwritten marks by Rurik's. Helena Rurik, in her late manuscripts, wrote a lot about the foundations of the new astronomy, about sacred astrology, about new planet, and so on. Her cosmogonic records are not translated yet. Well, it may not be necessary for everyone to become professional astrologer, but without minimal knowledge about the structure of the cosmos and its subtle threads through which interaction with people is carried out, it is impossible to achieve proper self-awareness of oneself in the surrounding space. 12. Historical places of the Rurik's. I would like to highlight this last point. Why? In my opinion, the protection of such places, wherever they be, should become the joint venture of all Rurik followers, notwithstanding their country. We know that Christ himself, while traveling, used to make simple clay objects and bury them in the ground in particular places. Those spots acquired a high level energy for the future. Equally, the places where the Rurik's lived and worked have a different kind of energy. As the UNESCO organization, for instance, takes under its protection the best monuments around the world, we should be able to protect at least the Rorik places. After all, wasn't the banner of peace entrusted to us for this purpose as well? For instance, very few know that the Krukety house in Kalimpong has been abandoned for decades. It is fortunate to have a better destiny now. Our Italian co-workers are taking wonderful care of it. But Svetoslav and Devika's Tatakuni estate in Bangalore is in ruins from the time of their demise. Moreover, in 2012 and 13, there was an attempt from the local government to turn its extensive ground to a dumping site for the Bangalore city's garbage or when the treacherous capture of the Nagararik estate was taking place in 2012 by joint hands of Moscow International Center of the Ruriks and local Himachal government, the world Rurik community hardly knew what was going on. And even those who knew and wrote protest letters were totally ignored by the country's officials. As a result, we lost that place, which Master Moria used to call our ashram. And Isvara Rurik estate near St. Petersburg struggles for life till now. I dare to presume that preserving the houses of our teachers is also part of our spiritual practice. Summing it up, I would propose to an idea. It would be only befitting in this new era and new century of Agni Yoga to organize the World Rurik Committee comprising of the members from different Rarik societies of different countries, the most experienced people who proved with their life, their allegiance and devotion for the teaching. The body alive and active, being there as a supporting international protection in times of need. Nicholas Rarik in his article, Help, wrote, quote, is help necessary? It is so necessary that it cannot be expressed by thought, by advice, by deed, 
and by all available direct and indirect means. After all, the main cause of the global crisis is the lack of mutual assistance. Meanwhile, it is quite clearly established that the current crisis is not of material, but of spiritual significance, readily, as if pronounced yesterday. There is only one more thing I would like to say. Success of a real cooperation depends on one condition, on the presence of an inexhaustible source nourishing us at this work, that is love and faith. Only through the re revealed mystery of heart, we can enter the new world. Only the highest energies of heart may broaden our consciousness, refine and transmute our thinking. Only a kindled heart will give an impulse to selfless service. Then only we will be ready to enter the new era community in the new world. In true spirit of the words pronounced over 2000 years ago, quote, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another, end quote. The Gospel of John. God bless us all and may the world be well. Thank you.